Hello. So today we are going to start a new topic, uh, which is basically related to some extensions of uh, the network flow problem. So recall that in the standard max flow problem, we start with the concept of uh, a flow i along an edge. So we can consider that i is representing an edge and the flow across i is basically less than or equal to a certain capacity along that edge. So we basically say that flow i is less than or equal to the capacity along that, that edge. And then we add up all the different flows across a different uh, across the different edges uh, so basically if we can say that the edges form a path we take all of the summation of the flow across those edges and we get a flow across the path mu and then the idea in the max flow is that we obtain all possible paths between a source and a sink. Of course, we have to keep a particular order uh, from smaller to larger length of paths. And then we, we augment all of these paths in order to make, in order to determine the maximum flow. So we made a lot of assumptions when, when we were looking at the algorithms such as Ford Fulkerson and the uh, Edmund Karth algorithm. So, 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 what if we have some some uh, modifications into the basic problem? So, this 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 lecture is going to have a look at all of these, uh, you can say, extensions to the maximum flow problem. And then the idea is that somehow we have to take all of these extensions, and we have to reduce them. So, this is basically a reduction to the maximum flow problem. We know that the solution to the maximum flow is possible using the Fort Ferguson or the Edmund Karp algorithm. And but but we don't have the algorithms related to the extensions. So the idea is that we have to convert the extensions to the to the maximum flow problem. So one of the first extensions which we are going to consider is the uh, multiple source and multiple sinks. So you may recall that in the standard maximum flow problem, we only consider the presence of a single source and a single sink. In this case, we may be looking at a graph which consists multiple of these vertices. And in that case, the problem tends to be a little bit different. So we can construct a graph to, to understand the problem better. Let me get rid of some, some of the space on the screen. I'll make this a little bit smaller. Okay. okay, so this is the case which we are looking at. Here you can see that the standard problem of the maximum flow is applicable to the concept of uh, taking one source and one sink. Now, in the presence of multiple source and multiple sinks, things become different because recall that the maximum flow is equal to the minimum cut. The minimum cut between two, um, you can say, um, graphs, one, one uh, subgraphs, so one representing the source and the other representing the sink as T. Now, if, if you take the case of multiple source and multiple things, so really you are looking at some, some amalgamation of maybe perhaps the minimum cut between S1 and T1 and maybe the minimum cut between S1 and T2 and likewise the minimum cut between S2 and T1 and the minimum cut between the S2 and T2. So like like in that case the maximum flow is dependent upon a lot of cuts and the exact arrangement of these cuts is is difficult to, to establish from an algorithm's point of view so since since there is difficulty the idea is that that you can take the um, existing graph and you can insert two super sources so so all the uh, all the sinks 
uh, all the uh, sorry so all the sources you can introduce a vertex s star which is the super source and this s star is going to be adjacent to all of the existing sources in the graph and likewise you can take the case of a super sink in the form of t star which is going to be adjacent to all of the existing sinks in the graph now two variations are possible in re in relation to the weight between the i and j vertices so where i is representing the conventional sink and j is representing the case of the super sink so to what should be the value of these weights well there are two approaches in that regards the first approach is the case of no demands so basically in this case what we do is uh, each of the edges between the super vertex and the conventional source and sink vertices we place an infinity symbol so this can be any large values sufficiently large so that it doesn't play a role into into the formulation of the maximum flow so for example if we if we if you recall that we have to uh, develop uh, an augmented path we can take the case of s2 s1 to s2 to towards v1 towards v3 uh, towards t1 and followed by t star so in this case of course we can take the case of infinity 16 12 20 and infinity and when we consider the minimum of all of these values the value 12 is going to be chosen and it is going to be subtracted from all of these terms and you can get the idea is that the inf the infinity is not playing any role into the into the network uh, flow uh, problem let me fix this this should be minus 12 of oh, my 12 minus 12 is 0 now the next approach is the inclusion of demands so basically if we consider the without demand based approach we may have some some parts of the graph saturated quickly as compared to other parts of the graph because after all uh, the saturation depends upon the order in which we select the different paths so it may be possible that certain sources and certain things may be more involved as compared to other sources and things this can be rectified by the concept of placing a demand on each of the source and sink vertices and these demands can be expressed as as some symbols so let let me plug in these 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 symbols for t1 we will we will have the demand across t1 demand across t2 demand across s1 and demand across s2 now if we consider the conventional graphs uh, so if we consider the conventional vertices in the case of conventional vertices we say that if there is some incoming flow on the vertex v and if we take into account the outgoing flow on v and if we subtract them together this is going to be zero but if we take into account the original representation of the of the graph and we take the case of the source sinks we know that this is not applied because we simply do not have any incoming flow on vertices like s1 and s2 likewise we don't have any outgoing flow on vertices like t1 and t2 so when we introduce the super sink and we introduce the demands on the sources and the demands on the sinks we really have to change this flow conservation property to a demand constraint which basically says 
that the incoming flows and really did this would be applicable only on the sources and the sinks for the rest of the vertices the conventional flow conservation property of incoming flow minus the outgoing flow is equal to zero that is going to be that is going to be established but in the cases of sources and sinks we will have a quantity dv now if this quantity is positive that would imply if the quantity is positive that would imply that this is applicable towards the sink node and if the quantity is negative that would imply that it is applicable towards the source vertex and 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 one one way you can interpret is that uh, interpret this 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 quantity dv is that it is simply a flow that it is that is retained either on the on the vertices like uh, t1 and t2 or perhaps the vertices like s1 and s2 now you should play uh, you should pay uh, con uh, attention to the point that this demand is really placed on the vertex whereas what we have placed in the graph is that it has it has it has been converted to a demand on the edges so if we take this case uh, if we take the case of the uh, vertex s1 so basically it implies that the incoming edges which is basically d s1 minus the out going flow which is 16 this should be a negative number now the only way this number could be negative if d s1 is less than 16 so this is this is one way of interpreting the constraint likewise if we take the case of the 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 sink t1 well in that case the incoming flow is 20 and subtract the d t1 from it and the only way in which this this is going to give us a positive value is if the is if the d t1 value is less than is less than 20 so let us consider an example so i'm uh, what i'm going to do is that i'm going to substitute all of these weights with some values so let's take a case of dt1 as 10 we can take the case of dt2 as 8 uh, we can take the case of ds1 as 9 and also d s2 as 9 now please note that the the conventional approach is that the flow should be less than equal to the capacity on an edge in in the case of these edges which we have just included the flow should be less than or equal to the demand constraint d s or dt whichever is applicable and then in that case you will note that when we identify paths we may be facing a scenario where we get a flow but that flow is not correct the feasible flow would exist if the scenario of the total flow across ds uh, across ds is equal to the total flow across dt so you will you will look at it from the perspective of an example which we are going to solve right now let me try to let me try to create some space so maybe we can we can move this up here let me make it a little bit smaller and likewise we can move this part and we can make this a little bit smaller also okay the first step is to identify the different paths so we can take into consideration the movement from s to s1 from s1 to v1 from v1 to v3 followed by t1 and ultimately t likewise we can take the other case of s to s1 followed by v1 followed by v3 so we are we are we are going to come back from v3 to v2 we have v2 we have v4 we have t2 and lastly we have t6 
star. Then we can take into account S star. We can we can move it from uh, S star to S2, from S2 to V2, followed by V1, followed by V3, followed by T1, followed by T. Then we will have S to S2, followed by V2, followed by V4, V3, T1, and T. And lastly, we are going to have S star to S2, V2, then we will have V4, followed by T2, and lastly, T star. So please note that there were some some paths which 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 which, which can be considered. So for, for for example, which cannot be considered. So if we take the case of S2, S1 to uh, S1 to V1, then we can go to V1 to V3, V3 to V2, then back from V2 to V1, and then moving V1 to V3, V3 to T T1, and finally T1 to T. Now this is not a path. The reason is because we just we just have a cycle formed in it. So in that case, we are not going to consider all of the cases where where cycles are present in the augmented paths. So we can we can we can put aside these uh, we can put aside these pathways because we are going to use them inside our algorithm. Um, okay, this should be fine. And now we are going to embed the values into the Ford Fulkerson value uh, for Ford Fulkerson algorithm. So this is going to take a little bit time, but but uh, please bear with me while I write this down. So we have uh, so for, for for short form, I'm not going to write S star. I'm just going to write S S1 followed by um, S S2 followed by S1 V1 S2 V2 V2 V1 v1 v3 v3 v2 v2 v4 uh, v4 and v3 we have v3 t1 v4 t2 okay so a little bit short of space let me try to compress this okay so that is better and from V4, V T2 to V to, to to T1 and T, and we have T2 and T. So I think I need to squeeze it even a little bit more so that we can we can represent the flow value at the end. And plugging in the initial values, so we have nine, nine, sixteen. 13, 4, 12, 9, 14, 7, 20, 4, 10, and 8. Now please recall that we have to look at the at the shorter length paths first of all. So taking into account uh, the very first path, we can identify the vertices which are going to contribute. Over here are S2, S1, S1 to V1, v1 to v3 followed by v3 to t1 and t1 to t so in this case the minimum quantity amongst all of these these edges is 9 and subtracting 9 from these highlighted terms we are going to get 0 9 this is going to be 7 13 4 12 minus 9 is 3 9 14 7 20 minus 9 is going to be 11, 4, 1, and 8. And then the next shorter path, which is this one, we can consider that. So in this case, the contributing edges are S2, S2, S2 to V2. We will have V2 to V4, followed by V4 to T2, followed by T2 to to t and again the minimum quantity over here 
is 4. So subtracting 4 from all of these highlighted items, we are going to get 5, 7, 9, 4, 3, 9, 10, 7, 11, 0, 1, and 4. Now the next, we can take either of these uh, paths. So let's take the case of uh, number 3. And in this case, the participating edges are S2, S2, S2 to V2, uh, followed by V2 to V1, followed by V1 to 3, followed by V3 to T1, followed by T1 to T. And in this case, the minimum quantity is equal to 1. Subtracting 1 from all of the highlighted terms, we have 4, 7, 8, 3, 2, 9, 10, 7, 10, 0, 0, 4. And in the last case, if you notice, um, okay, so in the last case, uh, we, okay, so not in the last case, we can take into account the fourth, we can take into account the fourth uh, path, and we are going to take into account S2, S2. So, S2, S2 is highlighted, then followed by that we have S2 to V2, followed by V2 to V4, followed by V4 to V3, followed by V3 to T1, followed by T1 to T. Now notice that T1 to T is, is uh, saturated, we, so the minimum quantity which is going to be chosen over here is, is going to be zero. So in that case, uh, it will be better to skip this calculation uh, to, in total because it's not contributing to the maximum flow. So we can we can uh, unhighlight the changes. Four is skipped. Let's move to the fourth path as uh, uh, fourth path over here. And in this case, the contribution is from S to S two. Um, uh, sorry, S to S one. Okay. So in this case also, we can notice that. Uh, the minimum quantity is going to be zero. So in that sense, whatever flow is going to be coming over here, the minimum quantity zero is going to be selected. So this is also the case. Uh, the flow is saturated by just three augmented paths. If we do a total of all of these values, so, so this is the, this is the final step of the algorithm. And when we do this totaling, so this is going to be coming as the quantity 14. Okay, so please take into account the two edges S2, S1 and S2, S2 and T1 to T and T2 to T. So these are represented over here. So note that what is the total number of flow which has gone from S to S1 such that it is now saturated? So we, we basically have 9 over here. And what is the total flow which has moved from S to S2 such that we have 4 as the residual capacity of that edge? So we have 5 over here. So 9 plus 5 is equal to 14, which is equal to the flow value obtained over here. Likewise, if we take into account these terms, so in uh, uh, the terms representing the sync node, so how much flow has moved from T1 to T such that we have zero, so that is basically 10, and how much flow has moved from T2 to T such that the residual flow is now 4, so 8 minus 4 is 4, so we can take the case of 10 plus 4, well, this is also equal to 14. So that requirement that the total flow, that the requirement of a feasible flow uh, across the edges representing the source sinks, which is which is in this case uh, equal to 14, that is also the same as the uh, flow across the edges representing the sink node, the sink nodes, which is also 14. So a feasible flow exists because both of these two terms are equal. And also take into account that that if we represent the saturated flow, so in this case, um, in this case, S2, S1 is saturated. We also have V4 to T2 as saturated and we have T1 
to T as saturated. So in this case you can you can consider the cut has been applied over here and the minimum cut is equal to the edges moving from this graph to this graph which is also 10 plus 4 is equal to 14 and that basically solves the problem. And now the next extension is the so called vertex capacity Con, uh, vertex capacity problem for the maximum flow. So please take into account that we have always taken the flow as less than equal to the the capacity along the edge. So we can for, for, for ease sake we can introduce this E over here to represent the edge. Well in this case the flow also has to satisfy all of the vertexes which also have a certain capacity. So maybe we can represent graphically the problem like this. So where all of these cases C1, C2, C3 are representing the maximum capacity along the edges, we can also have some capacity across the uh, vertices as well. And then in that case when we are taking into account the minimum of C E we also have to take into account the minimum of C V and in other words we can say that the flow passing through a vertex cannot exceed its capacity. Well the solution for this is given like this okay and it's quite a trivial solution where we uh, have to apply some pre-processing step. Each vertex with a given capacity so we're taking it account into account the vertices uh, V1 and V2 over here. What needs to be done is that they must be split into two vertices called V in and V out. So as a result we, we will have this representation as uh, okay so this is the first vertex then we have V in for the vertex V1 and followed by V out for the vertex 1. So this is basically this vertex split into two. And then we have the edge capacity as C2 and of course this I, I have left this out this should be C1. And then we introduce this a split across this vertex as well. So this also needs to be split into V in and V out. So in this case I am going to apply the case of V in for 2 and V out for 2 and then followed by this vertex and the conventional capacity C3 over here. So all of the uh, because of the split which we have what weight should be embed over here well we can introduce the vertex capacity as CV1 and CV2. So as a result the problem has been converted into the conventional maximum flow problem and then the, the Fort Fulkerson algorithm can be can be implemented on this expanded graph. Okay, so likewise uh, to the to the uh, representation of maximum flow on edges, we should also take into account that the that the maximum flow is always determined on graphs which are directed. What if we have bidirectional graphs? So this is the next ex extension. In the presence of bidirectional edges, so a graph may have m one or more undirected edges. We can take the case of uh, S to V1, from V1 to V3, and from V3 to T, and from S to V2, from V2 to V4, and V4 to T. So, 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 so far this is the conventional um, a representation of a valid graph for the maximum flow. But but the case of an edge between V3 and V2, well that can be interpreted if we are going to construct a path across this graph, we can have either of these possibilities in the graph as valid. So we can move from V3 to 2 and likewise we can move from V2 to V3. Well, 
the idea is that each and uh, and of course this this uh, presence of a bidirectional edge may not be restricted to a single edge it could be the entire graph altogether well the solution is that this edge must be split into two such that we represent each of these directions separately so in the first case we will have a movement from uh, v2 to v3 and the, in the next case we will have a movement from v3 to v2 please note that any weight uh, uh, any capacity c23 over here will have to be copied as the capacity on either of these directions so it it won't make a difference whichever one we you choose also please note that when we use this representation of splitting as is this somehow mimics the concept of the residual graph okay so so in in um, uh, in the cons in the case where we want the ford fulkerson algorithm to give us a guaranteed answer we we include the residual graph concept in addition to our con uh, to our conventional graph and in this case if we are supposed to make a residual graph for a graph like this then it will include only the vertices which are appearing partially in the original graph it will not take into account these two this already is re representing or rather mimicking the behavior of a residual graph so with this with this uh, extension our graph with undirected edges has been reduced to the conventional directed graph and we can then solve it using the ford fulkerson algorithm okay so we can stop here and in the next video we are going to look at some uh, more uh, extensions of the maximum flow problem